Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of Kilt and Culture in honor of the season uh, and the fact that Rocky isn't around, so the studio's rather gone to pot. We thought we'd uh, run down some Halloween lore for you. Now, as everybody knows, Halloween, also known as Samhain, was basically created by the Irish. It is a very Celtic holiday, right? You knew that? I, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I did not know that until I started preparing for our infamous, at least to me, Friday the 13th episode. Mm -hmm. But uh, it became mm -hmm. very apparent very quickly that mm -hmm. a lot of that comes from that area. Mm -hmm. And a big part of this time of year, and of course of the culture that all of this springs from, is ghosts and goblins and things that go bump in the night. So we're going to run down for you a few of our favorite Celtic beasties. And since the Irish get so much attention this time of year, we thought we'd skew it a little bit more towards the Scottish side, just to give our Scottish brethren a little, uh, a little bit of limelight. But some of these creatures actually do range across all of the Celtic lands. Yep. So with that, we're going to do our top seven Scottish monsters. <laughs> So we're going to count these down. Ready? Number seven, the Slua. If you travel in Ireland or the Hebrides, keep an eye on the dark brooding sky and listen for the flapping of wings. Maybe it's just a few crows, or maybe it's the Slua. The name means the host and this malevolent flock of bird-like spirits fly through the night sky, hunting mortals. They will snatch you up so as to drop you from a great height, or they may drag you down into the earth, even to hell itself. Some consider them to be fallen angels. Others say they are the unforgiven dead. It may also be that they are the Gaelic version of the wild hunt, the ghostly hounds and spirits who travel the skies in winter, foretelling of death and disaster. One witness told the folklorist Alexander Carmichael that they fly about, quote, in great clouds, up and down the face of the world, like the starlings, and come back to the scenes of their earthly transgressions. What do you think of that one, Adam? I think that's kind mm. of terrifying. Maybe I'm thinking of the birds too much. You think Alfred Hitchcock? That's a common theme. I mean, being swept away by the fairy or by the by evil yep. is very common. Yep. And the wild hunt connection is interesting because um, there's a lot of lore about the wild hunt, from gods to dead people to monsters, and they're all basically flying through the skies mm -hmm. during the winter. I'm a fan of Lovecraft, mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. part of the power of Lovecraft's like tale and style is. It's sort of the vagueness. Of, there's mm -hmm. there's a, a oh, yeah. heaviness in the description of of sense and impression, but the detail is sort of left to the imagination to build up. And mm -hmm. so you, you know, each one is, as you kind of hear the stories told, your mind gets to like fill in with its own personal horrors, the blanks of yeah. of how yeah. this this swarm of of birds either lifts you up or drags you down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. I, knew, I normally do not think of the birds as dragging you down, so I think that's an interesting bent on mm -hmm. the, on the I story. I agree, I agree. Do you want something more specific? Then sure. we'll move on to number six. The Ish Uska. You may have heard of the Kelpies, the Celtic shape-shifting water horses found in streams or rivers. Well, the Ish Uska is the fiercest and most dangerous of them all. This fiend disguises itself as a fine pony or a handsome man. You will find it along the shores of the sea or large lochs. As a horse, it will bid you to ride it. Perhaps you will take it home as a prized addition to your farm. If you are a woman, it may appear as a beautiful man who will invite you to dance and embrace. But don't be fooled. This fiend's lovely skin adheres to its human prey. Once you touch it or mount, you are trapped, and the creature will dive to the depths of the loch with you in its grip. There you shall drown, and the Kelpie will tear you apart. It will devour all but your liver, which will float to the surface. 
That was pretty intense. Like, yep. Yeah. Like the birds, it's the birds were a bit. The birds are abstract. Yeah, but the, this is like, yeah. this is like body horror. It's in your face, sticking to you. Yeah, that's I. Which is why kelpies are some people's favorite monster. Actually, there's one story of a boy who touched uh, an ush ushka uh, in its horse form, and his finger got stuck. And it started to drag him into the lake, but he escaped by cutting his own finger off. So the next one is sort of horse-like. Might not freak you out as much, or you're ready for it now because it's horse-like. I'm still freaked right. out by the last one. So how is okay. the, is this okay. Okay. is this one going to solve my wounds somehow, or just kill I me in a different way? It'll probably just kill you in a different way. I was Number five, the Nuklavi. If you journey to the Orkney Islands, far to the north, perhaps the most terrifying fellow you may meet is the Nuklavi. A native of the sea, he appears as part horse, part man, with the human torso rising from the center of the horse's back. His mouth is that of a pig, or perhaps a whale. But most horrific of all, he has no skin. As you look, you will see his thick, black blood coursing through sickeningly yellow veins around pale sinews and powerful grotesque muscles which pulsate as he moves toward you. The Nuklavi is pure malevolence. His breath withers crops and infects livestock. He is the bringer of devastation and famine. In fact, he is so feared that the Orkney Islanders will not speak his name without immediately saying a prayer afterwards. The Nuklavi is a hunter of mortals. If he chases you, your only chance is to head for the nearest brook. The only thing that can stop him is fresh flowing water. Fresh flowing water apparently is a lot of monsters bane, especially yeah. if they come from the sea. And the Nuklavi is kind of, he's also kind of seasonal. Like he, yeah. um, he comes at certain times when uh, the people of the Orkneys would be uh, burning and processing kelp, basically burning seaweed to make, they actually called the finished product kelp back in the day, mm -hmm. and they'd use it for various things, um, like uh, amending the soil. Then supposedly the Nuklavi was, was really, really averse to the smell of the burning seaweed. That's, that's what drove him mad, and it would okay. cause him to come out of the sea to uh, hunt people and destroy things and, and cause famine. And, and I think it's interesting that the Nuklavi comes about during this time when they're they're burning the seaweed and they're using this to to kind of fertilize the soil. Yeah. And the nuclavi comes and mm -hmm. curses your and crop. And curses it. So it just so happens that if yeah. your crop fails that you have a reason why it happened. So you want you want to come back to dry land now? Are you going to make me afraid of dry land? Dry land? Of course. Okay. Of course. Let's do it. Number 4, one of my personal favorites, the red cap. The red cap, also known as the Powery, is a foul and murderous goblin of the border regions. He makes his home in the ruins of castles and churches, especially along lonely roads through the moors. He prefers those places which were once the scenes of murder and battle, and in this gloomy land there are plenty of those. The red cap appears as a short, thick-set man with long, fang-like teeth and bony fingers that end in talons. His large eyes glow a fiery red, and his grisly hair streams down his shoulders. The red cap wears iron boots and carries a pike staff, that is, a combination of a spear and an axe. When travelers take refuge in his lair, the red cap attacks from above, either pelting them with huge stones or skewering them with his pike staff. After the kill, he soaks his cap in his victim's blood in order to maintain the color. It's said that if the cap ever loses its color, the red cap will perish. So we could defeat charming. him. Charming. Yeah, it, it is charming, but we could defeat him with like Clorox or Tide. <laughs> <laughs> Gets out blood. <laughs> I I love the red cap just because he's ornery. He's like the black sheep of the of the of the of the gnome folk. You know what I mean? So he's done enough. Like, screw this! I'm sick of this. Yeah. 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 But 
he's, uh, um, yeah, I just, I just love the, he's got style, mm -hmm. you know, if that makes any sense. And the border regions really are, there's other ghost stories and things that happen in the border regions because it was a nasty, nasty place for several hundred years. The other thing is they don't talk about how you can defeat him. There's, there's really nothing you can do to avoid a red cap. You just have to, well, you just have to avoid him. Yeah. You can't, you can't fight him. Well, he's too dangerous. He's too tough. Shall we move on to the next? We, we've, we've done sky, sea, ish, and, uh, and, and the moors. We're going to the, go, go into the forest now. Number three, the Bob and she. The Bob and she is a wanderer of the wooded highlands, a dark fairy. She appears as a beautiful young woman wearing a long green gown. However, if you look closely, you will notice her feet are in fact the hooves of deer. This sultry vampire preys upon male hunters as they stalk deer alone in the forest. She is drawn to them by the scent of blood on their clothing. Often she will manifest in the evening after a lonely hunter expresses his desire for female companionship. Drifting into the firelight, she will dance with her victim until he is exhausted. Then the mysterious woman's nails turn to talons, with which she will slash open the man's chest and drain him of all his blood. I have to say, if you're there in the woods, like, you're in the woods, you're away from everything, and you're like, oh boy, it's so lonely out here. Yep. And then someone just conveniently shows up yeah, that yeah, you ever wonder, movie. yeah, I don't know. It, it's like you're in your own badly directed movie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You should you should take note of that. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, the cabin in the woods is probably not a good place, you know. Don't read the funny book downstairs covered in flesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, all that. Yeah, don't It do could that. be, I, I, I assume they're drinking, maybe. Yeah, so they're, not, they're maybe not, completely, not completely aware. That being said, I it's don't. It's possible. It, I take it from my, my limited understanding. They weren't like, Hammering it away at the evenings, they would, you know, they take a little nip to ward off the cold. Mm -hmm. And again, you never yeah. know. Yeah. Now the, the the blood, the blood on the clothing attracting uh, the vampire part, is interesting. Part shark. Kinda, but that actually dovetails with number two, the Benya. Known in both Scotland and Ireland, the Benya is among the most ancient of spirits. Her name means simply the washerwoman. But this is no scullery maid. You may meet her near water, perhaps the rocky banks of a mountain stream. From a distance she may appear quite normal, sometimes an old hag, sometimes a beautiful young woman. But move closer. You may notice she has only one nostril, one long tooth, webbed feet, or a single low-hanging breast. She'll be hard at work pounding laundry on the rocks, but no, no, it's not laundry. She's washing the bloodied grave clothes of people who are close to death. There is a slim chance she will grant you a wish if you act in a certain way, but it is just as likely that she encompasses your doom or the doom of someone you love dearly. She is absolutely a classic. She's kind of slightly related to the Banshee, but, um, in the, in the sense that she brings a warning a lot of the time. Sometimes, sometimes she's, she's a ghost that's bemoaning deaths that have already happened, but more often she's there as a harbinger of doom. And it, it is interesting, because sometimes a portent of doom for you, occasionally on like rare occasion, there was, you find she's washing your enemy's clothes, and I think mm. you had mentioned mm -hmm. that in conversation mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I find that interesting. and. Even if you can, there were a couple different, some very weird ways of gaining power over the washerwoman. Mm -hmm. And then she could tell you about your future or you know, give you some hidden yep. bits of useful yep. knowledge. Yep. We're pretty much done here, but we have one left. And this one, you could actually meet. Number one, the gray man of Ben Makhtui. Lurking among the misty hilltops of Ben Makdui is a terrifying beast. Hillwalkers, hikers, 
and tourists have felt the icy presence of a thing which is not quite a man. We say felt because rarely has the creature been seen directly. Rather, it is described as a presence, or at best the vague shape of a huge shambling man in the snow and fog. Hardened hikers are reduced to shivering wrecks as a pervasive sense of dread comes over them. Then they hear the ominous footsteps behind them, and then they run. Known as the Liachmur, or the Big Grey Man, this yeti-like creature has haunted Ben Makdui for over 100 years. The best record of an encounter with him is from Professor Norman Colley, who in 1891 wrote graphically of his terrifying encounter with the Grey Man. Colley himself thought perhaps his senses were playing tricks on him. That is, until he compared notes with other explorers and found that they too had met the creature. All speak of the sheer terror that accompanied the creature. Once experienced, few climbers return to Ben Makdui and the terror that lurks there. But if you dare, the mountain and the gray man await you. Scottish Yeti. Scottish Yeti. That's beautiful. Scotland does everything better, man. Scottish vampires, Scottish Yeti. Well, he had, he had a cousin that came over to the States and moved out to the North Pacific Northwest, I it's, believe. Yeah, yeah, and it's possible that uh, the Grey Man is actually a Yeti who's just touring Scotland because Scotland is one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world. So, so he's finally gonna catch up with someone and be like, man, this place is great, you know? Been here the whole time, came over, I just yeah. stayed. He's just it looking, he's looking for somebody to take his picture. <laughs> That's the way it is. Like, and, and every time somebody does, it's always blurry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and, then, and then the curse is renewed, he has to keep hunting for another tourist to try and get his picture taken. Now, did you have a favorite out of all the our top seven? I chose seven, by the way, because it's a lucky number and I didn't want to take any chances. I appreciate uh, that. You're given, very welcome. Given recent experiences, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm torn between the red caps and the washerwomen. Okay. I, I still think the okay. washerwomen are just like an absolutely fascinating mm -hmm. bit of, of myth and folk tale. And they, like you said, they they have this place for like, giving you that sense of terror as you're like going through the woods, you know, am right. I gonna run into a washerwoman? Right. There, there is that, but she can also find her place in, in you know, mythic stories as the general mm -hmm. like yeah. prepares to lead yeah. his army and he sees the washerwoman. Is she there for him? Is she there for right. his enemies? Right. I, I like the, the, the motion in her story. The, I get there's, that. There's That's more than just it. a being there to terrify you. I think she's, she's, part of it. she's part of the hero's journey. Is what you're saying? She's she can yeah. be part of my journey if I'm traveling there. I oh, Adam, <laughs> come on down to the rocks. It's very nice. <laughs> I still gotta go with the red cap though. I just for some reason he just, you know, he's he, got style. He's got moxie. He's a stylish murder hobo. Stylish murder hobo. Yeah, pretty much. So yeah, what is your favorite Celtic monster? What is your favorite Celtic ghost story? Irish or uh, Scottish or Welsh, any of them. There's so much out there. Share with us in the comments if you want to. Uh, let us know what you'd like us to talk about uh, anon, and uh, we'll be happy to be creepy with you. Indeed. And with that, a happy Samhain, happy Halloween to all of you. Stay warm, stay safe, keep all the doors and windows locked.